Good afternoon, everybody. So we are on for our um, first such, um, let's say, interview uh, for Stir, Stir World. And um, for this, we have Ivo Groen from Paris. Uh, maybe I will get Ivo to kind of a bit introduce himself. He's quite well known in the European design situation scene and uh, let him introduce himself. At the same time, I'll also kind of make a quick introduction about myself. I'm, I've edited several magazines, I've written a few books, I've been involved with various design projects and automobiles and designs. My major passion, and that's the reason why we are, one of the reasons why we are doing this story. Avik, if you would like to introduce yourself before I think we give the floor to Ivo. Yeah, I, I've spent, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm like the wide-eyed fan fan here, okay, listening to uh, or being part of a conversation with uh, a celebrated designer and with a celebrated author. Uh, well, and that obviously tells you that, you know, I do have this, this unending passion uh, for anything, you know, mechanical and automotive. Uh, spent, spent a few years in the automotive industry in India, uh, and um, have, have this wonderful love for, for, for cars and for wheels um, and for mobility. And that actually brings me here and, and thanks to Stir World for actually bringing us all together for, for, this, for this session of freewheeling. Well, I think that's my cue and I can, I can, <laughs> I don't know if I'm celebrated, but I'm definitely very happy to join this uh, discussion with, uh, with you gentlemen. And of course, uh, uh, Avik, uh, I know you a little bit now. Gautam, I've known for a couple of years, and we share a very specific passion about uh, what I would call uh, Italian genius in design. I'm not Italian, but I have an Italian first name, Evo. So maybe my mother, when she chose this name, she kind of transmitted uh, my love for, for Italian design or Italy in, in an indirect way. So, um, uh, be it as it may, I've, I've been a designer since 1990. Uh, so that's been uh, over 30 years as a professional. And of course, I started my career at, uh, at Citroën. That's why I'm in Paris. And uh, uh, as it turns out, uh, the gentleman who designed the car that inspired me to come to Paris was an Italian as well, Flaminio Bertoni who designed, of course, the original 1955 DS. But as, as a youngster, as a little uh, kid, uh, I still remember playing uh, with some friends in, uh, in Amsterdam uh, at a birthday party. And I picked up a little model, uh, 143rd scale, which was sitting in a box. And it was uh, Alfa Romeo Carabo. I had no idea what it was, it said something about Bertone behind it. Anyway, that is for me, one of the, the I would say, key moments uh, becoming someone interested and passionate about design. And the other, I would say underlying factor is my father, who's a mechanical engineer. He's no longer with us, but uh, he was always tinkering with his cars. And, you know, he, he might get bored on a weekend like this and, and take the, uh, the, the boxer engine out of the, his beetle and just put it on the kitchen table and, and redo it and then put it back in and clean it up and, and you know by Sunday we'd be going off on a little trip <laughs> and everything was fine so those kind of simple times you know the 60s 70s uh, they were also um, pure times for design a lot of innovation and so I'd like to give the floor back to you guys and and because I think we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, why the area was so fruitful in creativity, in design in general, and specifically in automotive design. Starting with the 1920s, um, you know, when coach building came into vogue and we had stylists who worked with the coach builders, designing very attractive looking automobiles before the Second World War. Where again, I think uh, France was one of the countries that had really the lead when it came to the most innovative or the most interesting design, the period after the Second World War, where the, let's say, the baton for design moved from France to Italy, where Italy became then the Turin, Torino became the mecca of design. 
and where um, you know some of the greatest designs of the automobiles have been from that city or from people around that city living around around in Italy uh, during the you know after the Second World War from the 50s, 60s, 70s onwards. I'm a very, very, very big fan of the French coach builders. You know, the pre-war stuff, uh, Figoni, uh, Figoni Falaschi, uh, Portu, and the beautiful cars they had, Delahaye, uh, Bugatti, with uh, Jean Bugatti uh, and his team designing some of the most beautiful cars. So I would definitely agree with you that the, the late 20s, early 30s were just amazing uh, in France. But at the same time, they... They were doing some really interesting stuff with uh, Gordon Burek and the guys at Duesenberg, uh, Cord, uh, some real innovation. So I would say I would put America in there as well as a very, very, very big counterpart of France. But I definitely agree with you that after the war, after the Second World War, which changed everybody's lives, uh, the, the French politics uh, made it as such that uh, the French creativity could not be uh, uh, expressed freely you know, because the government decided who should build what. And, you know, uh, getting the industry back in shape again, which took a very long time, people, uh, you know, the companies that survived, quote unquote, because they were still in shambles, they were uh, assigned what to design. So once you, you take away that freedom, and this whole uh, creative uh, urge of, of creating beautiful designs, etc., it was not really... Um, the strong point of that period in France. I remember having uh, a lunch with uh, one of the founding founders of Peugeot, uh, Mr. Pierre Peugeot, and he said, you know, in 1940, when we, bought out, uh, we brought out the 203, um, people had been waiting to buy a car for 10 years. They didn't care what color it was, you know, what it looked like. They just, they were waiting to buy a car to, to get mobile again, the freedom of that, get back to what life was like before the war. So, uh, you know, they used uh, surplus war paint and all the Peugeots were gray. You know, they were battleship gray because there was a lot of that paint around and no one had money to, to come up with new colors. And then the colors started coming. And to go back to Italy, you know, the Dolce Vita, you know, and everything, we have this romantic feeling about the Dolce Vita. Well, that was the very, very early 50s. Um, before that, though, and I link it back to the war again, there's one car um, that was very interesting was the... Uh, uh, 1946 uh, Pininfarina uh, Speciale, built on a 1942 Alfa Romeo surplus truck chassis. And this car um, was actually driven by uh, Battista Pininfarina to the Paris show. But because Italy was still considered on the wrong side, you know, during the war, he was not allowed to demonstrate uh, his car and his savoir-faire his coach building um, at the Paris show. So what he did in a very, very stout way, very uh, amazing marketing for, for the time, is he just parked it across from the Grand Palais and uh, everyone who was going inside the Paris Motor Show, which was the biggest show uh, uh, since the war, 1948, they would walk across this beautiful car. And, uh, you know, if he got into trouble, people saying, hey, you gotta, you got to move along, he would drive it across the street, put it back there again. And this car, uh, which, of course, was built by his coach building company, uh, we think it was designed by Pietro Frua. But no one knows, because at the time, the designers, which didn't have the name designer yet, they were just one of the guys from the team between the metal beaters and, you know, the guys making the mascarino, the wood shapes to, to beat the, the, the metal on. And uh, they were paid the same salary, but uh, Pietro Frua was the guy who was uh, in, in, in charge of drafting. He knew how to draw and he probably designed that car. No one knows. Uh, we found some reference material uh, in the Gia uh, reference books where, they, where it's written on a picture in the back, Frua, uh, Pininfarina Speciale Frua. So we imagine the guys at Gia at the time thought or knew that it was designed by him. And there's so many stories to tell about these guys. There's a tendency for people to think that uh, uh, what really changed car design was Cistalia. Yeah. And maybe I'd like you to give your point of view on that. Okay. Well, I think um, another very, very brilliant 
uh, designer engineer, uh, aerodynamics engineer from his studies was uh, Giovanni Savonuzzi. And Savonuzzi was one of the talents that would give his idea uh, as, as a designer to Pininfarina. And he designed the Italia. And the Italia, of course, became a very, very famous car for two reasons, I would say. First of all, because it was a beautiful uh, synthesis of what a GT car should look like. And, and many cars followed kind of that formula. Um, but also because it came to America and it was used in this famous uh, MoMA uh, exposition years later in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So again, and I can go back to Pininfarina again, Pininfarina knew he had to go to the new world and the new world was America. And this, one of the reasons why the Italians managed to get out of this terrible situation from the post-war rubble, you know, everything was just flat, is because they knew that the new world, you know, which they had <laughs> actually named with Amerigo Vespucci, the new world, they had the money, they were powerful. So they would uh, use their talent, their finesse, their craftsmanship. And Pininfarina, Battista was one of the first guys who went over there and promoted the Cis Italia. So I would say it's a great case of marketing, but more power to him. He, he had that uh, idea of saying, I need to communicate on the skill set we have. So the brand name Pininfarina became really a brand, as it were. And, you know, he did the Nash uh, cars uh, and all sorts of other cars. In fact, this American connection that you bring up, um, I think there's, um, I mean, Pininfarina was not the only one. As you said, he was probably one of the first to actually, uh, you know, take, uh, can really get across to the US and start selling. But then, if I'm not mistaken, Ghia and Bertone and others also did. And uh, which then brings me that what would be the next most significant design after the Speciale, which you think started changing the world of design or perception? What is, what is the next one which you think is well, that? Yeah, you, you mentioned Bertone. And of course, I, I was referring to Franco Scaglione, who was a, a very, very brilliant guy. Um, very creative, left-handed, as many uh, creative designers are. I'm right-handed, by the way, but it's just a detail. That's I've probably that noticed many, problem, maybe many creative people happen to be left-handed. I've never understood why. Da Vinci was left-handed too, but this gentleman, he was a consultant designer. He uh, one of the first, you know, after Mario Rivelli de Beaumont. He did not want to be tied down to one company. But he, he made a deal with Nuccio Bertone. He said, uh, I'd love to work for you. And after the war, he was doing some uh, work as fashion designer. He, he was a stylist in fashion, but his real passion was of course, uh, car design. And he said, I'll, I'll do your work, but uh, I want to be recognized for that. I want my signature to be known. And Nuccio Bertone was just such a, uh, the antithesis in that respect to um, uh, Battista Pininfarina. He was, he was not uh, bothered about giving credit where credit was due, you know, to his creative guys. So Scaglione came up with a car, uh, which was the 1952 uh, Biposto Abart. So it was a, a Fiat, uh, a small displacement, again, like the CC Italia, a little bit bigger, 1500cc Fiat chassis. And he, uh, he did the Abart Biposto, 1952. Uh, this car, of course, again, going back to America, it was this whole jet age inspiration. You look at the front end, it looks like th uh, three reactors, you know, in the front. Uh, it had, however, uh, another connection with uh, the, uh, the uh, aircraft industry in that it had the fins in the back, which were creating the airflow, you know, to, to, to reduce the turbulence when it was breaking off, you know, before before adapting the camtail uh, uh, principles that uh, uh, that Faxenfeld uh, had come up with uh, at, at CAM uh, in the 30s, you know, the camtail. Uh, one of the other ways of doing it is to take these wings and then create a very small airflow and reduce the the, uh, the friction. So, so the idea of using tail fins, the wings, yes. uh, actually did come from the US. It's not really from Italy in the sense that the first use of the tail fin was in the US. Of course, there it was probably more styling and not actual aerodynamics. Yes. Where do you see that? I mean, well, I, because this is 52, 
that you're talking about uh, the 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 um, abarth biposto yes. whereas in 48 we already had tail fins in with America. the cadillac yeah with the cadillac that's yeah. right i would i would say how it's, would you it's, yes yeah. see the tail fins the italian tail fins versus the american tail fins how will you differentiate them uh, i think you just uh, pinpointed it i think one uh, one was styling and being inspired by you know the Lockheed airplanes and, and it looked cool, it looked fast, and it was styling, and the car weighed two and a half tons and probably didn't go any faster because of the wings. And the other one was what I would call design, meaning using true aerodynamic skills, which Scaglioni had, to make a very small displacement car, you know, tuned fit 1.5 liter car, you know, reach 180 kilometers an hour because of the aerodynamics. So um, using uh, aerodynamic skills to actually improve the performance. And you can see also in the later cars, uh, the Zagato cars, you know, where they reduce the frontal area, uh, which is where the double bubble came from. All those things were made really to improve aerodynamics, added to lightweight construction. Scalione, as you just touched upon, had spent uh, some five or six years in India as a prisoner of war which is not exactly, I'm sure it didn't contribute to his design skills. But um, his other designs that followed Biposto, I think some of them are probably the most significant designs in the 50s. Would, do you think they were, they were also, let's say, benchmark designs that went on to define the future of design after yeah, that? Definitely, definitely. It, it's kind of ironic because the, the, the series of bat cars, the Berlina Aerodynamica Technica that he did for Bertone, and always remember one thing, the impetus was always Bertone behind it. Bertone was trying to make business. And when people say the Alfa Batmobiles are Alfa Romeos, they are, but only as a chassis. Meaning in the, in the beginning, it's Bertone who's proposing with Scaglione to Alfa, look guys, if you apply aerodynamics, your cars will be more efficient. So the state of the art chassis at the time was the 1900 Alfa chassis, which was the post-war car. So they got away, you know, to go back to the Alpha. I, I mentioned the, 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 the very heavy duty six cylinder that were coach built, you know, like the Pininfarina Speciale I mentioned. That was a pre-war type chassis. It was heavy, it was very expensive. So Alpha to survive, they needed to come up with a unibody car. And so they, they started developing the 1900, which was also given as a separate chassis to coach builders. And so Bertoni said, I'm gonna take state-of-the-art chassis, the 1900, and we're going to do these aerodynamic studies, and we're going to prove that our savoir-faire, the way we know how to build things, just look at the wings on the Bat 7, the Bat 5, you know, amazing artistry of how could you make that even out of metal? So uh, to, go, to go back to, to the Bat car, the first one, 1955, that was just an absolute benchmark car because it proved that you could make a car go 200 kilometers an hour due to a 0.21 CD, which was just unheard of at the time. So the same car with, with a normal Alpha body on it, it was probably 30 kilometers an hour slower, you know? So truly, truly, um, Bertone, Nuccio Bertone was just a brilliant guy because he knew how to recognize the talent. And he always, a little bit like his competitor, uh, Battista Pinifrena, he, he was always um, creating the opportunity. You know, the idea of the show car and the Italian show cars, why were there so many show cars, is when they didn't have business, they would provoke the business. This is the whole idea, you know, show what you're capable of doing. And of course, always associating it to the, 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 the most modern chassis that was available at the time. The same is true with the Mura. Maybe yeah, right. I just want to ask you one thing, Ivo. Uh, you know, what you said was interesting, that post-war... Um, you know, the, the outcome of the war actually uh, possibly also decided the outcome of, you know, the parts that, you know, automobile styling and design took in Europe and vis-a-vis uh, -vis what happened in the U.S. And, you know, the victor obviously built things which were bigger, heavier, um, you know, didn't really care too much about efficiencies and, and also, the, also the use of, you know, precious fossil fuels, whereas the vanquished, you know, went about, uh, or not only the vanquished, but also the ones who were more destroyed. Yes. Okay, they went about, you know, being, being more efficient, being far more frugal, but at the same time, bringing back the optimism 
uh, in their lives by creating such wonderful pieces of uh, of, of of creation this I, i love the way you 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 explain it because it gives me a, suddenly a vision of forest fire you know where where the trees are burnt and then suddenly all these new trees spring out and and it's this urge this vitality you know life goes on uh and and when you have like you say you have no resources you become really creative i always say that you know when you when you're working uh, with a team of creative guys you know designers you don't need to be 500 to be creative in fact it 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 will probably bog you down you need to you need to have you know the right amount of 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 brain power and then you need to be able to express it etc but you know the the it's a little bit like the startup uh, uh, approach you know uh, the creativity a couple guys uh, get together they have some good ideas they're on the same page and and they have nothing to lose they only have to win so there's this vitality and i think uh, that is really really what marked the italian creativity back then and but again let's be honest the fact that there was the big american you know market. finance on the other side and the marshall plan and the marshall plan uh, you know very crucial people forget the marshall without that people would have been too hungry to be creative exactly. you know exactly savonuzzi to go back to the cc italian he did some other really really cool cars you know he did the uh, the supersonic series absolutely right uh which uh, again on a, uh, actually the first one was built on a alfa romeo uh, chassis 1953 modified mm-hmm. by conrero who was basically like a bart you know uh, fine tuning cars and that was of course declined on a very very famous uh, range of cars which was the otto v the, the fiat range yeah. of cars and even jaguar aston martin etc but um he did that car which was extremely creative and then he did something totally different you know the same guy which was the gilda 1955 and the gilda funny was a stunning it was like a flying dart you know so now we're going from But from that's american connection yeah and 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 he ended up this is what i'm saying this italian genius you know engineer aerodynamics engineer designer uh self-taught designer the american said hey come over so he became you know one of the the chief engineers as it were not even designers in in the the turbine program for Chrysler they said we need this guy we need someone as creative as this to help us out and there's always been this this cross pollination the flow of energy we go oh there's something really exciting happening with these guys here so let's get them over and see what it can stimulate but you always need the means it's always the the combination and hard work hard work because you look at those guys in Italy pounding away at sheets of metal in dark kind of grimy shops with no light you know you look at the pictures of the zagato michelotti workshops they they were sheds you know and and these guys they were work, working extremely hard in the 50s in america what we saw was mainly styling a lot of these over the top chrome laden barges ships Uh, which of the american cars is the one which you think was a breakthrough which are the most interesting are there any american designs that yes. you would consider as breakthrough designs yes. you know i i i always think about this a lot and and for me the corvair was actually a very very interesting car why because the americans realized that this over the top very heavy type of model you know the model of construction big ladder frame chassis heavy bodies with chrome bumpers that weighed 50 kilos each that was not going to survive it was kind of a dinosaur and well, and was that the realization of the success of the beetle the Volkswagen beetle but kind of got people to think that maybe there is another world out there exactly I mean, you you put your finger on it the fact that the beetle started to sell well in the US when this was a pre-war uh pre-war how should i say it in in a sense arcade design yeah. but the fact that it was frugal simple and reliable that made the 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 head guys at gm say okay let's let's at least cover that market and again we're talking about money they didn't say oh you know let's think about the world and not you know creating too much pollution etc cetera, etc cetera, because you know the 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 price per gallon at texaco station it was you counted in cents you know i, I don't know exactly but uh, Uh, 
but it's the the thing of losing market share you know you're no longer alone you know we're no longer a separate continent the little beetle people are buying it so what did they do is they inspired uh, their engineering with the rear wheel drive uh, air cooled engine etc but they made a really really cool car because it's it's a six cylinder you know before Porsche made a six cylinder it's a flat six I don't want to go into the whole Ralph Nader thing because that's not what, what's yeah, interesting. What's interesting is that that car, which of course was perfectible in, in presented in 1959, I think, uh, and commercialized in 1960, that's that right. was a revolutionary car also because it was very low slung, very beautifully proportioned. It had some really, really modern lines at the same time, a little bit Baroque in the front, but it inspired again, the Italians, you know, the, 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 the Fiat, uh, the Fiat was a copy of that. The, it's by the Germans, the NSU. The NSU, it's kind of the, the snowball effect, you know, who's inspiring whom. So now it, it, it means it's a world market. And I, I think if I go back a little bit, I go back to Battista Pinifarina with the 1955 Lancia Florina which was a very, very, very beautiful car designed by Francesco Salomone, um, 1955. That kind of shape, it became the shape of a formal sedan. I mean, you look at a 1961 Lincoln Continental, which I, I love, it would have never looked like that if they hadn't done the 1955 uh, Lancia, which became the Lancia Flaminia, which became the Peugeot 404 which became a lot of Austin's, Austin's and, and Morris and all yeah. the English cars. So, again, I'd like to say there's always this, this electricity between Italy and America. This is really happening. At the same time, let's not forget about the French. I go back to my, my uh, 1955 DS. But if you look at the styling, it was, it was finished at the last minute. It was a 10 year program, 1948. They, they had some, some prototypes already running. But the final styling, it was again, to be very honest, it was also a little bit um, uh, influenced by America because it was influenced by the Studebaker, you know, the 1953. I think the, the, the good thing about good design is it, it has no boundaries, uh, culturally and physically. So Now tell us a little bit more on the DS because that's uh, no doubt is a very, very significant car. Yeah. And a lot of things changed since... Well, I think what's significant about the car is that um, I think it's the first time that uh, a chief engineer and a, a chief designer and um, a company president were all on the same page. You know, they wanted to do something really, really, really radical. And it wasn't uh, a question of you got to do it for tomorrow. Just get it right. It has to be. Probably not the first time. It's probably the third time. You said Trin had done that with the Traxio Avant, yes. way back in 34, 35, well, and with the Dos Chevaux. So maybe, yeah. but it's probably the, one of the first companies that was doing it that way, working that way. Yeah. The, designer, the, the, the Traction Avant is a very interesting story, but uh, Traction Avant, we can talk about it some other time. I think, even though it's a very significant car, a lot of the innovations, such as front wheel drive, etc., already existed for a long time. Exactly, that's true. That's true. What was really, really interesting about the Traction, also de uh, designed by uh, um, Flamini Bertoni, was that uh, the package of that car made it look very low and it had beautiful proportions, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And industrially, you know, they, they raised the factory and they put together a new factory to get that monocoque uh, thing happening. So, but again, the monocoque thing was already invented by Lancia with the, with the Lambda. So in yeah. fact, for me, uh, André Citroën was a brilliant guy. He was a brilliant engineer, but he was not a car engineer. But he knew for the Traction, he wanted to do all the good stuff, put it together in one car. The difference with the, traction, with the DS, uh, véhicule grande diffusion, you know, the, the big car, is that André Lefebvre, who was an aerodynamics engineer, who had started at Voisin, you know, the, the, which is also a car maker, but originally an airplane uh, pioneer. Um, he wanted to do a car like he would design an airplane. And that's why it looks like it does. And mm -hmm. instead of saying to his designer, uh, by the way, you're gonna make this look like an airplane. They were, they were completely in sync and they were like, oh, how could we make a car that is gonna 
have a, a way of being positioned on the road thanks to the invented the invention by Paul Magès, you know, the hydrodynamic suspension, always have a constant uh, uh, slope to the to the ground, parallel to the ground. How could we make this kind of airplane for the road look like a beautiful car? And so it's just, you know, I could talk about it for hours, but it's really using the aerodynamics, using totally new engineering with a suspension, uh, with a self-leveling suspension, which was an invention by a self-taught guy, you know, Paul Magès. He was uh, he was just one of the engineers there. He, had, he because of the war again, he had never been able to do proper schooling, so he'd learned all this stuff. He had these theories that he put into into work, and. Even the interior design was radical. You know, even the roof, you know, the fiberglass roof, letting some light through. Everything about the car was radical, everything. And it took them, I always say, you know, uh, even today, it took them about 12 year, years to get the car right. You know, there was so much stuff going on. And, and as, you, as you know, originally it was supposed to have a flat six boxer. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Which it's... was designed by Walter Becchia, an, an Italian who, who did the Taubo Lago cars. And of course, they ran out of money by the time uh, all the other engineering was done. And so they put in the old traction avant motor, which is why you have to go through the, uh, the cowl area to get the fourth spark plug out. Exactly. You know, because it, it wasn't designed for it. Okay. So anyway, the, the, for me, even if you forget about all that stuff, it's the only car when I'm walking in the street in Paris. When it... When it I can just kind of smell it. it. It's I see something come and it's like wow, it's a DS. You yes. see that car, and everyone still turns their heads. Exactly, exactly. It, it's the only car, you know, mm. the only what I would say post-war modern car, where everyone agrees that it is just an amazing sculpture. It's a floating sculpture. It's just a magic carpet ride. And if I go back to my design heroes, you know, Gandini, Giugiaro, Aldo Bro, Varone etc etc when you ask those guys um, which car would you have loved to have designed and they have designed amazing cars they all say uh, even Fiorovanti the DS I know. you know this is this is the dream car the other thing that's really exciting uh, about that car to me and that's one of the reasons I came to Citroen uh, it seems very kind of naive but it's a car that was designed I wouldn't say it wasn't designed for the people as the deux chevaux, but it was designed to be diffused, uh, grande diffusion, uh, to a maximum amount of people, meaning it had a purpose. It was not a one-off car for one rich guy, you know, who, who would just uh, uh, have some fun with it and probably sell it a year later, get something else, uh, you know, show off to his friends, et cetera, et cetera. It's really a car that, again, uh, has influenced design throughout the world. Uh, afterwards but has never been successfully imitated fortunately fortunately you you, you mentioned in the we are in the we are, we are talking about the corvair now after the corvair is there any other american car that you think was uh, no less significant or was very important in terms of design at least in terms of uh, benchmark i have to make a transition i stay just one second with the corvair the corvair i go back to italy again hmm. it gave a lot of show cars since it was such yeah. a modern car, Absolutely. then Pininfarina, uh, Bertone, they well, all the wanted the chassis. The models give the cars to yeah. these, these uh, design studios. To yes. Yeah, imagine. Bill Mitchell, he was like, okay, guys, have, have a run with it, you know. Exactly. And, and I think that got the ball rolling, but it also proved that Bill Mitchell, who's just a, an amazing designer, team leader, he loved Italian cars. And he uh, would do his European trips and he would come back, you know, to the studio and uh, he would talk about the stuff he had seen, bring back pictures, et cetera, et cetera. And so one car to me that is the synthesis, and it, it seems like a contradiction, uh, contradiction, but a synthesis of all those Italian influences is the 1963 Corvette, the C2. Because all the shapes that look ultra modern and we think, oh, that's an all American car. And it is because of what it does, you know, with the big V8 and, 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 and the noises and the exaggeration of it all, especially the split window, et cetera, et cetera. It uh, inspired um, a lot of other cars, but it was inspired by all the late 50s, mid 50s cars done by Michelotti um, and 
so that's why for me the Corvette uh, 1963. I love that car. The Stingray. The, the Stingray, Stingray, yeah, Stingray. Mm -hmm. it, it's really, really significant. It's a real benchmark design. Yeah, absolutely. Then coming back to Europe after that, what are the cars subsequent to that that you think in the 60s changed the world of design? 1967 Marzal. And I think it was a very, very popular toy at the time. Um, this car, uh, Marcello Gandini designed it. Uh, it is to me the ultimate show car because how can you outdo the Mura, which was a beautiful car, but still was using what I would call um, uh, 60s body language, you know, like Ford GT 40 type uh, body language. How could you outdo that? And uh, this gull-winged uh, glass spaceship, which was the Marzal, not only did it uh, kind of break the paradigm of, of, of doing a two-seater car, it, it was a four-seater, it had the gull wings, which of course existed also since the 1954 300 SL, or even Bugatti did a, a design in 1939 of a supercar that was never built because he, you know, Jean Bugatti passed on. But the gull wing uh, concept, it wasn't just to say, okay, this is radical, etc. It was to show the interior, which was extremely radical. And uh, with the glass below the, the belt line, uh, but really the, the body language, of this car. And I, I think the body language was beginning to get a little bit sharp already with the, uh, the 62, 63 uh, Avanti. But uh, uh, again, America, uh, very Italian influence, but still uh, made, in, made in America out of fiberglass. But the, the silhouette of uh, the uh, Marzan, the idea of using glass, the importance of the greenhouse, uh, the stance of the car, the fastback shape, um, everything, you know, no power bulges in, on the hood because the engine was actually in the back. Uh, the, the very, very low, uh, the low squat nose with the, with the you know, the, the, the six headlamps plugged in there, a little bit uh, inspiring the SM, by the way, later than uh, many other cars. It was just such, an amazingly modern car. I mean, when I look at it now, I'm just, uh, you might see, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a picture of it. I look at the car because it's easier to talk about things when you see them. I look at the car, the belt line splitting the upper and the lower halves. And at the same time, it's one unit. You know, it's nothing is, looks like it's added on. You couldn't take anything away. Uh, even the interior, you know, when I look at the, uh, the, the Peugeot, uh, you know, the, the the instrument panels of, of modern Peugeot's. If you look at the instrument panel of, of Marzal, which was also designed by, by the same small team, it looks like a eye cockpit already, you know? <laughs> uh, everything about the car, inside, outside, uh, was just radically modern. There's, there's one car done um, a year before, which is the 1966 Flying Star II by, by um, uh, Gauzeria uh, Touring, you know, with uh, Formenti, Federico Formenti and, and uh, Bianchi Andaloni who designed that, which has kind of that shooting break, very sharp, cre uh, you know, uh, or uh, creased paper, folded paper uh, surfacing. Uh, but it still had what I would say the proportions of an older GT. And this Marzal, I could go on and on, the proportions, you know, the center line of this car. The way it looked very wide, it was, very, it was extremely low, you know, uh, around a meter high for a two plus two seater, looking airy, looking with excellent uh, front visibility, etc. For me, there are show cars that come out today that are less radical and certainly less successful than that car. Lamborghini was so was so besotted with the Mazal. That he said that you know this this is the this this to me is the perfect advertising car, you know more than a production car. It seems somewhere I, I think in his in his biography or somewhere it's mentioned yes. that he says you know I can I can I can actually earn a billion uh, you know bucks out of you know advertising because it always gets featured on the front pages of newspapers. Sure. And and I would need only a few millions to actually produce it. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, it's interesting having this story because, you know, there's a very famous legend about this car where because it was such a small budget company, 
at the time, he really needed the advertising. So when he, he sent it off to the Monaco Grand Prix and, you know, and you have the famous story about, uh, you know, uh, the princess taking a spin, you know, on the circuit opening, you know, doing a pace car lap uh, of, of the Formula One. Grand Prix, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Sorry? The 67, the 1967 Monaco Grand Prix. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so right after the Geneva show, drive it to Monaco and have Princess Grace kind of take a take a spin. And of course, Ferruccio Lamborghini was a very, very conservative person, you know, well brought up, etc. He he apparently called up Nuccio Bertone and said, what the hell were you guys thinking about designing a car where you could see, you know, a lady's uh, skirt, you know, as, as she's sitting in it. Get, stop doing all that all that crazy stuff that's that's over the top because he was just shocked seeing you know uh seeing uh the the princess's legs you know etc so of course in the in the espada 1968 which put the engine back in the front none of that funky stuff about glass below the belt line but how many show cars all the way till till today do we have with below uh, the belt line glass you know or the gullwing doors to to demonstrate the interior design, it's become a standard since the 1967 Marzal. So everyone has been copying that without knowing about it. It's just that before that didn't exist. So it's become like a 27th letter of the alphabet. You know, you have 26 letters in in, in, the, in our alphabet in any case, and, and now there's a 27th one, and it's Marzal. You know, comes to, so when it comes to a vehicle, you know, like the DS. Uh... Um, maybe also, you know, something maybe not as evocative, but equally powerful as the Mini. Uh, do you think they, they almost end up becoming like national? Cars? I mean, they actually stand for all that is, you know, evocative and emotional and all the, all, all the, all the ethos and the emotions of a country get distilled into that one product? Um, it's, it's too complicated a question for me to give you a good answer on. But what I'd like to do is bounce off the Mini. The Mini inspired Gandini on the Marzal. Think about that. How radical is that? Here you have a, a Greek origin engineer, you know, who did the Morris Minor. And then when he did the Mini for packaging reasons, it's total design. It's all about design. Transverse front engine. Do it, guys. You know, uh, the Fiat Nova Cinquecento was doing it in the back, but it was a, it was not front wheel drive. Uh, it was kind of old school, good package, but the Mini was the best package ever. So when Gandini was trying to do this really low car and give enough space for the, uh, you know, for, for the four occupants and still have a low nose, he, he, he combined the Mini with the Beetle when you think about it, you know. It, it's, it's, fact, you know, but my point is coming back what Avik mentioned about whether the Mini or the DS eventually reflected the country as much as well the other way around. That finally, these are the cars that reflect the country. Yes. It's not the country that's reflected in the cars, it's the car that reflects the country. Yeah. In the sense that eventually, maybe today, if you think of the, you know, if you think of France, DS is one of the very images that come in as part of it. It's like the Eiffel. Exactly. Now, it's not that, um, you know, so, so it's the same thing with the Mini. Now, and the Mini, and then, of course, with the Mini goes the Mini skirt and with George Harrison and, and the whole, whole music. music and yeah. the, you know, the, the whole 60s, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the hippie revolution, etc. So sometimes it's, it's, it's these cars that make that nation. It's the cars... Absolutely. You know, that, that eventually make the nation. And it's the, that's the reason why the, the automobile is such an important cultural icon for the 20th century. That eventually it's these cars that make the nation. It's a Beetle that defines the Germans. It's a Mini that defines the English as much as the DS defines the French. Absolutely. After the Mazal, then, so the, the world didn't come to a stop with the Mazal. It moved on. What do you think? Or it didn't? It, well, you know, for me, the, the seminal designer's car is again the Carabo, uh, 1960 Carabo. Can you imagine this guy? So in 1966, you do the Mura, then 1967, you do the Marzal, and then 1968, you do the Carabo. And it just blew Pininfarina out of the water. You know, they were like, what is going on? And before talking about the Carabo, you know, the first wedge car, and I, you know probably even more about it than I do because you've studied it very carefully, but I think the, the Carabo, it was such a, a shock 
to, to you know, formal language for car designs. You know, everyone tried to apply it to normal cars. It didn't necessarily work as well for normal cars, but it really gave uh, an electroshock at Pininfarina. You know, Pininfarina said, hey, uh, the guys at uh, Bertone, <laughs> they've got the hot stuff. And I think someone like Paolo Martin, who had uh, come to Pininfarina via Bertone, you know, he had done this summer project, uh, which became the Modulo. Modulo, I thought, That's what is interesting about the Modulo is, you know, with the, we're going back to the, the cant cantilevered canopy, you know, and, and, and there's kind of, it was, originally it was designed as a black car and then it was presented as a white car. There's kind of a product design approach to it, you know, mixing, you know, the modular product design idea and even the interior, you know, with the, with the, the bowling ball as an as a ergonomic uh, idea. Again, very, very little means gives you uh, lots of creativity. So I think Modulo was very, very interesting in, in what I would call uh, it being a designer's car, meaning I think people were beginning to set up uh, what we call design schools for product design, uh, uh, transportation design, et cetera. That was a benchmark, you know, to say, okay, this is what a car looked like in 1970, and this is what a show car looked like. What, what's happening here? Okay, this is modern and this is old. This is new, why? Look at the color, look at the graphics, look at the shapes, look at what it's doing uh, to uh, the way you use space. All of these things, it's architectural. It's, it's, so Modulo is a very, very, very important car. Very important. The, the CX and the, and the, and the, um, uh, the GS and, and all those cars, you know, even the Lancia Gamma uh, sedan, they were all very much inspired from the uh, 1967 British Motor Corporation car done by Pininfarina. That was the ultimate, what I would say, translation of these very beautiful silhouettes, very, very nice fastback silhouettes that the Marzal did. Uh, and even in some way, uh, the Tommaso Mangusta did as well, you know, Giugiaro's Mangusta. That kind of shape adapted to uh, a sedan, Berlinetta, uh, a, Ber a Berlin, a Berlina, sorry, Berlina Aerodynamica, and very aerodynamical. So that became the standard. In, we're coming back to the SM, because that's when you're in the 70s, and we said we'll come back to it. So we yeah. maybe come back to it. And what do you think of the, what do you, what is the significance of the SM? in the scheme of things in terms of design? Well, to me, uh, the SM, it's, it's full of, um, it's full of contradictions actually. It's, it's beautifully elegant, but it's a huge car, you know, like the DS, it's a very, very, very long car for a relatively small uh, seating area. You know, it is a two plus two, but it has very little space in the back. But never mind, because if you're sitting in the front as a GT is usually used by two people and there's enough luggage space to, to go on a weekend, et cetera, et cetera. It is so beautiful. The seat design is beautiful. The dashboard is beautiful. The, 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 surface, the surfacing on the car is beautiful. That really simple front end, you know, that expression, even though the Marzal did it first, very, very simple expression of those, uh, you know, uh, square or rectangular headlights. It's so pure and it has such grace, you know, it has the grace of the, uh, of the DS, but even more, it's in more of a dart type shape, a little bit more balanced than the back because they didn't cut, cut off the rear uh, so radically as the, as the DS because the DS was just too long. They had to get rid of uh, some of the overhang. But that's another story. <laughs> the SM, I think, um, is the last beautiful French car made and it was it was killed by bad timing you know with the fuel crisis etc cetera, etc cetera. making a car that uh, consumed uh, 18 to 25 liters for 100 kilometers uh, it was just uh, it came out a little bit too late uh, bad timing bad timing and, and since the 70s you think um, design has tended to let's say almost just stagnate but uh, there, were no, no, there haven't been that many revolutions. There haven't been well, that many benchmark cars. You think it's, I mean, design kind of got defined. It reached its peak 
in the late 60s and into the 70s, and then that's it. Since then, it's... Well, let's put it this way. The very, very, very strong silhouettes that we've just evoked um, have disappeared to more standardized silhouettes. And it's, you know, if you look at the how thin the A-pillars are on a 60s car, whether it's a DS or an SM, which was born in the 60s, Today, you can't do that anymore because of the shock, you know, rollover, et cetera, and, and all the regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm nostalgic about that design period, it's because, um, you know, you weren't carrying 300 kilos of safety equipment and you weren't carrying an extra 200 kilos of body protection for crumple zones and et cetera, et cetera, and airbags and this and that. So it's actually, you know, today's design, it's even more complex. And it's even more difficult to come up with a very, very unique silhouette. But the challenge is still there. I mean, I think if you look at the, the full scope of cars that, uh, that are being built, there's a lot of different uh, uh, car companies and a lot of them are startups. And let's hope the startups will survive because uh, they're the ones who are going to, they don't have to shed all that weight, you know, all the, they, they can just go forward. And of course, with uh, Electric cars, the packaging is very different. Everyone says, yeah, well, it's easier. No, it's not easier because you got to get all those batteries in there. It's in a different position. So there's a lot of, I would say, I would say today we're designing show cars that are going to tell us what the, what the cars, the production cars will be looking like in the next five years because things do go very, very quickly. And so if we talk again in five years, maybe you'll say, hey, by the way, out of all these cars, there is a couple of Marzals there's a couple of SMs in there, I hope. In that sense, don't you think that, uh, talking of startup and you're talking of the current uh, batch of cars, uh, I think some of the more attractive cars today of a startup, which is the most successful startup uh, in recent times, Tesla. The Tesla, both the Model S and the, and the Model 3, mm. don't they hark back eventually to the aerodynamic car? and to the Marzal and the profiles are the same. Hmm. And in that sense, except for detailing and sculpting, they're still the same old design. I mean, the designs are from 50 yeah. years ago. I would, I would even be harsher with, with those designs in that, um, if you look at the exterior design, they are actually, and that was done on purpose from what I understand, they were actually quite conservative looking cars uh, I would say restylings of, you know, Jaguars of the time, or, or or just what I would call good-looking cars, classic cars, because uh, I think the the powers to be at Tesla and probably even Musk himself, uh, they didn't want to shock people too much on the styling. You know, the, there was enough radical stuff happening on the inside. You know, with, with it, a huge screen in there and and the technology and all that stuff they 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 said okay let's put this in a in a fairly conservative modern but conservative shell because we don't want to have people you know run away and say okay this is this is too much too much over the top so i'm quite i'm quite anxious to see what the next step is you know are they going to come up with something radical uh, and i'm not talking about the truck you know the kind of the, the truck thing they did but uh, are they going to come up with something uh, that is beautiful as well. You know, if you look at all the cars we mentioned, I think all of them are beautiful, but they are subjectively beautiful. It's a little bit like a face, you know, a face that has character. You know, it's always this old story about if you took a picture of a beautiful lady and, and you would symmetrize it, she'd be less beautiful because you don't have any quirks in the face. You know, too much symmetry looks too, too robotic, too standardized, and suddenly some of the charm goes away. So I think that expression, and I think, uh, you know, I, I work with young designers and a lot of them stand out. Uh, in fact, uh, they're a little bit pig headed. They have their own vision of what they would like to express. They're not trying to just emulate what is already successful. So I think there's a, a lot of creativity that, that will be coming up. Um, it's just such an investment now to make a car, but it used to be a lot of money as well at the time. It was, In that time, it's really you put a billion dollars on the table for an all new platform, new technology, new design, new factory. And, and you, know, you know, there's too many people who are going to say, well, are you sure this is going to be accepted? And are you sure this is not too radical? And is this not going to be too much of a pain to make in the factory, et cetera? So many factors. And 
you know, you look at some very, very uh, modern cars like the NSU R080. It was a very modern design, you know. But it uh, killed the company. Sorry? But it killed the company. It killed the company. And it was gobbled up by Audi, who was making very conservative cars. And then, well, you know, now Audi is a benchmark in design because they invested in design. They said, okay, guys, make the most beautiful cars uh, with the best quality, blah, blah, blah. So it's energy and the energy comes from the passion. So I, 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 I'm not worried about, uh, you know, if we do the same discussion in 20 years, I'm sure we can come up with some modern cars from, you know, th that will be outstanding. It will, they will not have the emotional connection that we have with the cars we just discussed because we didn't, uh, we, we didn't discover car design. We didn't discover uh, the mechanical wonders at that time. You know, it's kind of the, the, the view of a child. You're always talking about the child. You know, people say that classic cars, usually you buy the car that got you excited when you were 12 or 14 years old. And why? Because there's no filter. It's kind of the, the spontaneous, naive. I love it. You know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of my favorite Japanese cars is the Toyota 2000 GT. But to me, it's a very European looking car. But it's a brilliant piece of uh, Japanese engineering, you know, conceived at Yamaha. Even if you look at the dashboard, you know, the wood is done by the same guys that were doing the woodworking for the Yamaha pianos. The engine is a piece of art, the way it's built, it's a beautiful car. So I think what's really interesting about uh, that example is that um, the modesty of the Japanese saying, we, we want to emulate the Europeans, but we want to do the best quality we cannot fail we have to do the quality so this i think the japanese thing is really about bringing quality to an affordable level and quality and design to me are intimately related to me cars that persevere in time always have quality the way they're built the way they're put together that has to do with design and it's a design engineering you know crossing over into design styling and and i think uh, the contribution of the Japanese industry is huge in that respect.